Hello, I'm T.Y. Chang from TYT Investigates, and today I want to talk about hurricanes and climate change. Now, the reason I decided to do this today was because we recently here on the East Coast of the United States had a tropical storm uh, go up the uh, East Coast. It bypassed Florida, but then it hit uh, North Carolina, uh, knocked out 100,000 uh, uh, electricity in hundreds of thousands of homes and went up the East Coast poured some one to four inches of rain, a lot of rain. And uh, I noticed that it didn't get a lot of coverage because it's become so ordinary and mundane that uh, hurricanes are not that big a deal unless they're massively destructive because massively destructive hurricanes have become the norm. So then I thought maybe we should talk about why hurricanes uh, and are getting worse and more intense because of climate change. Now, hurricanes are in fact, uh, and I'm quoting from a, an article by uh, Jeff Berardelli that's published in the Yale Climate Connections. And he's a meteorologist and a climate change scientist who actually works for CBS News. And <clears throat> he talked about saying that major hurricanes are the, by far the costliest natural weather disasters in the world and uh, sometimes causing up to a hundred billion dollars in damage, more than that. And the, there is clear evidence now that the global warming caused by climate change and increase of temperature that uh, humans are creating is making hurricanes stronger and more destructive. And the trend shows that it seems to be in fact getting worse. One interesting thing about this is that you have like five categories of uh, hurricanes, up to category five, depending on how intense they are. And one of the things they're finding is that the categories one and two, sort of the less powerful hurricanes are becoming less frequent, but the more intense hurricanes, the four and fives are becoming more frequent. Uh, and uh, which isn't really a wonderful thing, right? So, um, just to, to define things, now we're, we call them hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean. They're called typhoons in the Western Pacific and cyclones in the Indian Ocean. And the, um, the way it starts is basically once the, the water temperature uh, reaches about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and then you have atmospheric conditions for moisture and uniform winds, then a tropical system begins to evolve. And in the Atlantic, we call them when they, they start a tropical depression. And then as it gets stronger, it becomes a tropical storm. And then finally, when it reaches 74 miles per hour, the winds in the, the tropical storm reach 74 miles per hour, it becomes a hurricane, or it's defined as and termed as a hurricane. So, um, so since 1985, there's been a fairly consistent average of about 80 tropical cyclones formed each year, ranging from a low of 65 cyclones to a maximum of 90. So in terms of frequency, studies have consistently shown there's no discernible trend in the global number of tropical cyclones. But that same study found that the strongest hurricanes, category four and five storms, seem to be increasing. So in other words, those storms that would have been one and two, meaning you know, not that intense wind, not up to 150 miles an hour, but somewhere around 74, they're becoming less frequent. And the ones at the higher, temp higher speeds, more destructive ones are becoming more frequent. And um, one of the things that they're finding is that they are uh, intensifying more quickly. Uh, as a result of Harvey, Irma, Maria, and Michael in 2017 and 2018, uh, the hurricane record in the Atlantic found that rapid intensification increased 4.4 miles per hour per decade. And that the gains to the shift in the warmer phase uh, was part of a natural cycle, but What's not natural is the intensification and the uh, 
that they're just more intense and they're more intense storms. Um, they did say that global warming plays a role now, using simulators, simulations from one of the most advanced climate models available. It's called High Floor, H-I-F-L-O-R. The team of researchers concludes that the recent increases in rapid intensification is, quote, outside High Floor's estimate of expected internal climate variability. Basically means the model's depictions of the climate oscillations cannot be explained just by the observed trend. In other words, that it's by human uh, what we've done in terms of increasing the amount of carbon and increasing the temperature. Uh, one of the most understood, to understand this link between warming world and weather, one of the most well understood and robust connections is the increased rainfall. Now this tropical storm, Isaiah, uh, or Isaiah uh, had a lot of rain. Uh, and first it also had a lot of wind, but once it hit land, in the Carolinas, you know, when you hit the different structures and trees and everything, it slows the wind down. But the rain was very intense all the way up, all the way up the East Coast. And uh, now, one of the most well understood and robust connections is this increased rainfall. The warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold, and the more rain it produces. That's what it basically runs down to. So the increase in rainfall follows the, an equation which dictates for every one degree Celsius, that's 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit increase, the atmosphere can increase 7% more moisture. And this type of rainfall doesn't fall uniformly. Uh, it's, it falls in sometimes with like a convergence of moisture into a storm not only leads to higher precipitation, but also for some storms, greater intensity and growth. So we're seeing a combination of warmer air and warmer water lead to increased rainfall beyond a, a simple understood, uh, what they call the clausius clapeyron uh, clapperon relationship. Um, now, one example of this that they talk about often now is that there were 60 inches of rain. You know, that's like a whole year's worth of rain practically that fell in 2017 in Southeast Texas and Hurricane Harvey. Remember all the flooding in, in Houston. The researchers concluded that a repeat of rainfall that intense is predicted to happen only once every 9,000 years. Now, most of the rain is caused by Harvey's extremely slow movement. You know, it, uh, it was just raining a lot and it didn't, you know, the hurricanes usually move up in a couple of days. This one just hung over Southeast Texas or was it southeast? Yes, yeah, southeast Texas for a couple of days. Uh, but studies have concluded that a significant amount of rain can be traced to human caused warming, with various estimates ranging from 15% all the way to 38%. And they're, they're using the terms, for want of better terms, calling it biblical amounts of rainfall for Harvey's rainfall in 20, uh, Hurricane Harvey in 2017, in southeast Texas. And uh, MIT's Kerry Emanuel calculated a six-fold increase in the probability of an event of that magnitude since just the late 20th century. So when people, when we talk about climate change, and, and more often we're calling it a climate crisis now because it's getting, happening faster than what some of the scientists had believed before. It's surprising even the climate change scientists, the climate scientists, environmentalists, and when we talk about, well, things are going to get worse, there's going to be more problems with, you know, the weather and pandemics and, and all these things. This is one example of why and understanding why. So when we have more intense hurricanes, imagine if we had a hurricane like Harvey hit, you know, Texas again, where Texas right now has a high rate of COVID-19 infection from the coronavirus. So imagine if that were to hit now, and what happens is when people shelter, they go to these huge, you know, gymnasiums and school gymnasiums, and sometimes even things like the Astrodome, and they'll go there. But when they do that, then they're all, they're doing exactly what shouldn't be done, which is 
large numbers of people congregating and they would spread the, uh, the COVID-19 virus. So that's, imagine if there was a Hurricane Harvey hitting Texas right now. So what the predictions are saying is that as we, as the temperature increases, we're going to be seeing more of intense hurricanes, greater rainfall, and then more pandemics. And then, you know, there's a question of the food shortage. And they're also talking about that the rain is not going to fall consistently in all areas, that it will be falling in some areas, but be, you'll have drought in others areas. That's why we have those wildfires on the West Coast. So as the wildfires increase there, and I remember when I was in Vancouver a couple of years ago, it was the summertime, uh, I hadn't been to Vancouver in six or seven years. It's a very beautiful city. And I remember looking up and thinking, you know, why is it the sky so gray? This is the, my most recent visit. And it turns out that now every summer in Vancouver, the forest fires north of Vancouver in British Columbia uh, are have now perennial in the sense that every summer they have these massive wildfires in Canada because of the continuing lack of rainfall up there. And what's happening now is every summer now you have gray smoke lingering over Vancouver. So you have combinations now as if we don't deal with the climate crisis. And, uh, you know, the U.S. is one of the two world's worst polluters, the U.S., China, and then after that, India, probably because us, because of the amount of, um, the amount of consumerism that we have here. And then also in China, the amount of consumers and just the number of people approaching 1.4 billion and the number of people in India more than 1 billion people. These are the three greatest polluters in the world. And um, if we don't address that, that's what's going to, you, we're going to be seeing more and more intense hurricanes. And they will happen at the same time that we have pandemics. At least that's the prediction of scientists. That's the expectation. It's a probability. Uh, how, how high a probability, I don't know. And then, so when, as it gets worse, what we see now in terms of hurricanes and the present pandemic Scientists, the majority of scientists have said that you know, it's going to be a lot worse if we don't get it under control. And uh, so that's my bit for today. Uh, I just thought it was interesting that you know, we had this tropical depression come up the East Coast and knock out you know, hundreds of thousands of electricity and hundreds of thousands of homes and cause all this damage and all this rain. And, it got a little bit of coverage and not much. I know there's a lot more with the COVID-19, et cetera, and the presidential race. But as that happened, I thought, you know, isn't it interesting that something this intense, you know, gets a little bit of coverage because we are, we've become acclimated and accustomed to, you know, these massive destructive hurricanes. And in fact, there are going to be more and more of those. So, and, um, and you know, this, my opinion on this, and this, this gets back to, you know, what I've said a number of times is that this, this election in November will probably be the most important election in our lifetimes uh, for many, many reasons, uh, but also certainly for the climate. You have to consider that, uh, you know, I, I, I do this rating scale where, you know, Green New Deal was 16 trillion, uh, Joe Biden's Green Deal is 2 trillion, and to me, Donald Trump, and this is an estimate, is negative 16 trillion. So just keep that in mind. And uh, again, that's opinion and, and not a reporting fact. So uh, let me now go to some of the um, uh, some of the chats. And uh, okay. Okay, let's see. Okay, they're talking about, DLJ said, I'm expecting Trump to claim that China has been sending in floods to the US in the form of hurricanes. Well, 
pretty clear why you know he's done that to me. Uh, this is opinion again, although uh, I don't think many people would argue with this is that when you, you know, this country has a long history of racism against Asians, uh, dating back to 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was the first act to do, deny any particular people entry into the US. That was expanded in 1924 to include all Asians and all non-white people, and really wasn't lifted until June of 1968 after three years after the passage of the Hart Seller Immigration Act that changed that. So basically for some 86 years, uh, it was nearly impossible. And then yes, just about nearly impossible for Chinese to enter this country legally. And then there's been you know, the incarceration of Japanese Americans. So by attacking China, which has become, is you know, a, becoming a new superpower that uh, Trump is able to, you know, basically tap into the long history of racism against Asians in this country. And even recently, you can see that, and the, the attacks on Asians after the coronavirus, and there were 2,500 uh, different uh, attacks ranging from assault to, you know, verbal uh, on a, that were, were reported in, in the United States. And a lot certainly were not reported. And then you have somebody, you basically have an enemy to attack. And if there's a long history of saying Asians are not really Americans, uh, even though they've been here more than actually many white people, uh, I've met six generation Chinese Americans have been told, go back where you came from. And then uh, who actually built the transcontinental, their ancestors actually built the transcontinental railroad. And this was in Denver. And then so if you have somebody like that, you can attack, then, then okay, then you say, oh, this, this is the boogeyman. Hey, look, here's somebody that everybody can hate equally. Uh, you know, almost everybody else can say we're, you know, has something you know, uh, to say about the Asians at one point or another, and then you can attack them and say, hey, well, that's an easy attack. Oh, look, China's gonna do this, China's gonna do that. And, uh, and certainly there are some truths to the fact that you know, the US is a superpower, China's a superpower, so they are going to have conflicts. They are going to spy on each other, and there are going to be uh, basically at, at minimal economic competition. But to me, economic competition is fine. I mean, in the sense, the U.S. has innovation, and China, you know, they, they've been working very hard. But that's okay. It's like the New York Yankees versus Boston Red Sox. It can be a tough, but you know, fair competition and stuff. It doesn't have to be one of you know, hopefully not military conflict, which would be disastrous for the entire world. But um, so when you have something like that, somebody that's an easy target, you know, that's something for Donald Trump. Donald Trump, everything he does is basically, this is my opinion, focused on him when he's consistent that way. So for him to say, you know, I want everybody to go back to work and I want everybody to go back to school is because he knows that's the way to get the economy rolling. And he really doesn't care how many people die. I don't think he really cares that much. I mean, when you bring it up to him, he seems to have had statistics skewered for him so that he can say, oh, it, it's really not that bad. And um, so the, uh, by attacking China, which is an easy target in this country, then he's able to focus that on, on there. And um, Tempo Dan said, the US anti-Chinese rhetoric almost rivals their anti-Black and anti-Muslim rhetoric throughout our history. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I mean, it's it's bad enough as it is, but uh, it is not approached. I, you know, what, you know, slavery and and the anti-black uh, discrimination is the, and also the the genocide of indigenous peoples, Native Americans, and the attacks on Muslims, the physical attacks on Muslims. Um, you know, were, I certainly the 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 anti-black and anti-indigenous peoples, um, what was done to them is far worse than what was done to, to the Chinese. Although there were riots and lynchings of Chinese as well. I mean, they're just, we weren't, there, there weren't that many of us before, so you, that didn't happen, but um, still none of it should happen. You know, that, that's the whole point of the United States, right? That we should all have liberty and justice for all, at least that's in the Pledge of Allegiance. And, um, oops. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Okay, now we've gotten on the subject about China. I'll give you one statistic, and you can look this up later. You know, the, there's a lot of coverage, and this is uh, both by the United States government and, and also by the mass media in this country. And, and I was certainly a part of that for a long time. And that is they talk about the Chinese expansionism and uh, going uh, two things. They're building a air, uh, was it an Air Force uh, landing strip, an air landing strip in the South China Sea. And they talk about China going throughout Africa and South America uh, and doing projects in order to get favor for China, spreading its influence. And what I thought was interesting is, so I looked up how many military bases China has outside its borders. It has four. And then I looked up how many military bases the United States has outside its borders. Anybody want to venture a guess? Let's, let's see. Can, let's see if anybody can type something. Venture, don't look it up. Venture a guess how many military bases the U.S. has outside of, its, uh, of our borders. Okay, well, no one's typing anything, so... Um, well, let's see, maybe they are. Let me go down. Okay, Dave C said 220. Hawaii, the, the Hoenn Barefoot said 50. John Get 500. DLJ 1000. DLJ, you're the closest. It's 800. You can Google this after we hang. So while the US complains about China building four mil their military bases outside its border, we have 800 military bases outside of our borders. And then the other thing too is when Europeans and the United States talk about, oh, you know, the Chinese are going to Africa. They built a railroad through Tanzania. They're going to South America. They built a railroad. They're building, I don't know if they completed it through Colombia and they're trying to gain an influence there. And I thought that was fascinating <clears throat> that the European powers when they wanted to gain influence in Asia, used gunboats and blew people up. And, you know, the whole thing about Hong Kong, which is, you know, the whole history of Hong Kong. In 1842, the British were growing opium. They were the world's biggest drug dealers in the 19th century. They grew opium in India, used American Yankee clipper ships, transported it to China and forced China to accept all this opium and, and created a country of addicts. And then when the Chinese governor in Guangzhou, Canton, and, and back then that's what we usually call it, Chinese Guangzhou, threw the opium into the water, very much like the Boston Tea Party, you know, did during the American Revolution. The British then brought their gunboats and created what they called open door policy, which meant we have the open door that we blew open with cannons to force you to be drug addicts, an entire country of drug addicts. And then the European powers came into China, the French conquered Vietnam, uh, and the, all the European powers and Japan went into China and carved out different parts of China. So what's fascinating to me is while the Chinese are going around the world building projects for people to gain influence, and that seems nefarious, people are forgetting the history of the Europeans and the United States using military power to force people to accept their control. Anyway, so I think we, some of the things that we uh, enjoy here in the US, we don't practice for other people around the world. And that's something to think about. And the other thing I would point out that for all of China's problems, Bill Gates has pointed out that China has done in the last 30 years what no society in the history, at least known written history, has done. And that's taken 500 million people out of extreme poverty. In the 1930s in China, my parents used to tell me that millions of people starved to death, literally millions, that people were eating bark off of trees to try and stave off hunger. And I remember my parents mentioning that when you were in the big cities for the middle-class people, you didn't really worry about the starving people unless they died on your doorstep, in which case you had to call the police to get rid of the body. That's how bad the starvation was. So, you know, that's something to think about as well. Uh, you know, certainly it would be great if we could have, you know, the kind of democracy we have 
here in America, um, you know, around the world, but maybe it takes time to get to that point, you know, because in Chinese history, every time you had a weak central government, you ended up with civil war. And um, they have an authoritarian government now. And, you know, I, I know that when I was in Hong Kong in 1997, some of the people living in Hong Kong asked me to stay and to report because they said, we need somebody like you to go after the, 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 um, the authorities, <laughs> to challenge the authorities. And um, I don't speak Cantonese and my Chinese, my Mandarin Chinese is pretty bad, so I didn't stay. Let's switch to another topic here. John Gatwick says, it's the same with the Trump administration freaking out over TikTok being a Chinese company because they might gather intel about America as if America doesn't uh, or hasn't been doing that, I think he's wanting to say for decades elsewhere. Yes, we have been doing that and all countries are going to do that. And, um, and what we have to do is recognize that in this new world, cyber warfare is a reality and that everybody has to deal with it. Uh, I, I, I think it'd be naive for us to assume that China, Iran, Russia, clearly, and, and the United States don't participate and uh, defend against cyber warfare. We, we just have to recognize that's a reality. And, you know, it, is TikTok going to be, uh, it, it, does, would China use that if they could? I think they probably would. Uh, should we ban TikTok for that reason? No, because the whole point is, you know, we want to maintain trade. Trade is good between our two countries. That doesn't mean that we don't protect ourselves. That it doesn't mean that we don't protect our, you know, patents, et cetera. I think that is correct to do. Uh, and that, but at the same time, that means you still try to have uh, trade. For example, I remember um, over the last decade or so, people would say, oh, we're buying all this stuff from China. And then I noticed that China bought like, 20 Boeing 7, uh, I think it was 7, 747s, like 20 of them. And they're like, you know, $100 million each. So I, I thought, well, you know, all that stuff, you see all those, you know, $2 inexpensive items that were made in China, you know, they're being balanced when we sell things like Boeing 707, 747s. And one of the advantages for America, and I'm going to end at this point, is uh, I think I've told the story before, and I think Wina says I like to retell my stories. But this is a good story to retell, and that is in the, about 20 years ago, a scientist at MIT won the Nobel Prize in Biology. He was from Japan. He said, "If I were in Japan, I could not have won the Nobel Prize because of the difference in culture that affects scientific research in the United States." versus Japan. He said, in Japan, you always respect the elders and respect the professors. In the United States, there's a sense of whatever's new is better than let's challenge the old, kind of like millennials challenging the bo hey boomer. So, and he said that kind of culture is good for science because science cannot sit still and assume that everything that we believe is, is correct. It always should be challenged to then have a culture to look for new things. And he said, because of that mentality uh, and that culture, that scientists in the U.S. challenge the existing knowledge, challenge their, you know, esteemed elders and professors, which is good for science. So we have this thing of innovation. The problem is, under the Republican administrations, and this is factual, not opinion. You can look it up. Under George Bush, uh, George W. Bush, and under Donald Trump, research and development in the United States that money for research and development has been dropped. And that's a huge mistake for, the, for America because the United States maintains its status as uh, one of the two most powerful economies in the world. It used to be number one, it no longer is. We're now tied with China because of that research and development. And that's something we have to recognize. We have to be practical and realistic in this world. Same time, we should base it on facts, not on prejudices and stereotypes. If you base it on facts, then I think, you know, we'll get along better with each other and with the rest of the world. So on that note, I have a good day. And, uh, you know, Jonathan Larson will be here on Thursday. I'll be back on Friday. And uh, as always in this pandemic, you know, remember the pandemic is still on. 
don't forget that. A lot of people are saying, oh, things are better. Like in New York, things are better. So people were going out to eat now. And, and I see people forgetting to wear masks, although 75% of the country is starting to realize, yes, we need to wear masks, social distance, wash your hands. And Dr. Fauci said that you might also consider wearing now face coverings, goggles or shields. He's saying because the coronavirus enters primarily through the nose, but also through the mouth and the eyes. So be safe and be well.